Okay, thanks, Aaron. Um, get going here. Uh, so this presentation is on uh, models and statistical tools for IGM. Um, the, the presentation uh, that I'm going to give here has got two parts that were combined together because they're um, they are related, but it's it'll seem like we're going to shift gears a little bit after the first part, uh, which gets a little bit technical. Uh, so first, we'll talk about river ice growth modeling, focusing on uh, common and relatively simple. Uh, well, one particular model, a relatively simple model for estimating ice thickness. Uh, and then, so of course, in order to have an ice jam, you gotta have some ice to start with. So breakup jam severity can be tied to ice thickness. So there's some benefit uh, to being able to predict ice thickness prior to predicting a jam, uh, although that may not always be strictly required. Uh, so we'll start with that simple model of ice growth uh, in relatively quiescent, slow-moving stratified water. Uh, we've, we've seen this figure here before. Uh, this is an ice cover over water, um, and heat is transferred from the water through the ice into the air. As water cools, it will grow ice downwards into the water column. Uh, the rate of, grace, of ice growth depends on the thermal uh, conduction through the ice cover itself. So, um, move on to the next slide here. So, we'll get a little more formal about what we're talking about uh, with, with heat conduction by using an equation. Uh, this may look a little intimidating, or at this point in the day, may make your eyes glaze over a little bit, but just hang on for a sec, because we're going to, I'll, I'll break it down into, into little pieces and describe what this equation represents. It's not, not as bad as it looks. Uh, so before we do that, let's just briefly mention the assumptions that we're going to rely on. Uh, first, that the ice is homogenous, meaning things like its density, its crystal structure, air content, uh, that, that stuff doesn't vary spatially. Uh, obviously, this isn't true in nature, but for a simple model like this, uh, that, that's a one assumption that we're making. Next, we're assuming uh, that the heat flux is in the vertical direction only, uh, so heat's only moving up from the water to the ice to the air. Uh, we're not considering more complex flows of heat along the length of the ice cover, for example. Uh, and last, uh, we're going to assume that the temperature profile through the ice is, is linear. Uh, so this equation here uh, formally is an ordinary uh, differential equation that describes the change in thickness. That's eta, that, that weird N-shaped uh, Greek letter, eta, is the, it's the ice thickness. Uh, so the change in thickness, the change in time, dt. So d eta, dt, that's the rate that the ice is growing down into the water column, kind of like the, the velocity, essentially. Uh, that equals the term to the right of the equality symbol, uh, which, so the first term to the right, uh, it's got on top the heat transfer rate per unit area, that's the Greek symbol phi uh, of the ice, and that's in the units of that are joules uh, per second. This is divided by the density of the ice, a rho, uh, times the latent heat effusion of the ice lambda. Uh, we've talked about uh, latent heat of ice several times already. Um, so remember that the latent heat effusion is, is the amount of heat that, that's got to be removed from the from a unit volume of water to reduce its energy state to allow it to go through the phase change uh, to its solid form. So uh, one thing to note is that the bottom term here, the um, uh, rho times lambda, that term is, is essentially constant. There's a fixed amount of energy needed to go through the phase transfer, uh, and we're assuming the density is constant. So uh, on the other hand, the top term, the heat transfer rate per area, um, so that, that's, a, that's a transfer rate per area uh, fee, that does uh, change uh, based on the physical environment. So we'll expand that term phi. You'll notice that the constant terms are rho times lambda are kind of left over by themselves in the denominator there, and the rest of the terms uh, are, are, are what are equal to phi. So these are on top k sub i. Um, that's the thermal conductivity of the ice. Multiply the, by the difference between T sub m, temperature of the ice at the uh, ice, or the temperature at the ice water interface, um, and T sub S, that's the temperature of the, of the ice surface or, or usually the air. Um, so this, this product is divided by the ice thickness, there's eta again. Uh, so you can see most of these terms can vary uh, throughout the year. So we've got some constants in the denominator and then some terms that are, that are gonna likely vary through the year. Um, so this is, this is the equation that we just were discussing. It's just kind of neatened up a little bit, uh, made a little more compact. As I mentioned, this is a, a differential equation. It's an ordinary differential equation. Um, we're not going to really go too much further into that. But uh, what we're interested in here is solving for eta. We want to know what the ice thickness is at some time uh, in the future. 
Uh, so the formulation on, on uh, the bottom of the slide shows the equation uh, restated with the sep using a separation of variables. Um, so that, that's just setting you up for sort of formally for some mathematics to um, be able to, to solve for, for eta. Um, so you can see the non-temperature uh, terms are outside the integral on the right side, and that, the, the implication of that is that they're they're constant with time. They're not going to they're not going to change. So we can approximate the continuous integral of the time-dependent terms uh, using a summation. So here we're doing that by taking the daily average temperature um, on the left side. We we're going to adopt the term freezing degree day here. So for a given day, this is the average. Uh, daily temperature is subtracted from the freezing point, which is also the ice water interface temperature, zero C uh, if you're using uh, SI units or 32 degrees F, obviously, if you're, you're in Fahrenheit. So for a day that's minus 10 degrees, the freezing degree days are zero C minus, minus 10. So that works out to positive 10 freezing degree days. So if it's minus 10 C average, uh, that's 10 freezing degree days. So the sign's positive, uh, like I said, for, for freezing degree days. Uh, the difference term uh, within the summation on the, the left side of the equation is, is the freezing degree day on any given day, uh, and the freezing degree days are, are accumulated once ice forms. Uh, and then they're, as you accumulate them day to day, those are uh, referred to as accumulated freezing degree days, or AFDD is a term that you might have heard before. Uh, so each day that we add uh, FDDs to a, to a running total. Um, and this can go on through an entire year. It gets a little more complicated when things cool, uh, warm up, um, and, but we won't, we won't go too much into that. Uh, the, the AFDDs are, are a daily approximation of the continuous integral. Uh, we're using U sub J to represent the solution to the ordinary dif differential equation, but keep in mind that this can be approximated uh, pretty well uh, just using AFDDs. I promise we're almost through the math here. Uh, so we're skipping a little bit of math, uh, but this is the solution to the ordinary differential equation. Uh, the square root comes from uh, taking the integral of eta, so we ended up with eta squared, which uh, is then taken care of by uh, taking the square root of the term uh, on, on the right side. So that's where the square root comes from for, for folks who are wondering that. So eta uh, is proportional to the square root of u sub j, uh, which we just uh, defined uh, can be approximated with AFTDs. Uh, alpha represents the square root of those constant terms that we left by themselves, which include the thermal conductivity of ice, the density of water, and the latent heat effusion of ice. So that's kind of a catch-all uh, variable. So we come up with a pretty compact formula here. Eta, the ice thickness, equals alpha times the square root of AFDDs. And then there's some other uh, numbers in the in the bracket here under the, the, the uh, square root term, but those are just accounting for going from um, you know, hours and seconds to, to days and that sort of thing. So nothing to really be uh, too concerned about there. Um, so some of you may have heard, heard to this referred to as the Stefan equation, and it's very commonly used to estimate ice thickness just based on air temperature time series and some assumptions about the heat transfer rates at the site. So it's pretty simple. Uh, and the, the math is a little bit, you know, to get through, but at the end of the day, we're just saying that we can estimate ice thickness by using air temperatures and uh, some assumptions about how, how heat moves through the ice. Uh, so below uh, here is a, is a table of alphas uh, that have been derived from field measurements of ice thicknesses. Uh, so you can see things like the depths of snow and the amount of wind uh, present at a site uh, may vary alpha uh, because these factors affect the thermal conductivity uh, of the, the ice and snow layer that the heat has to move through. Um, so it's, it's pretty basic and maybe even arguably a crude model, but it does a surprisingly good job of estimating ice thickness provided that you can reasonably estimate alpha uh, for a given location. Uh, so this is just a simple example I'll go through quickly here uh, of using AFDDs to calculate ice thickness. Uh, on the, the, the first column of numbers there uh, is a time series of average daily temperatures, which are then converted to freezing degree days by subtracting them from uh, the freezing temperature. And this is in Fahrenheit. Um, so we were subtracting from 32. So uh, you can see the air temperature starts out at 20 degrees F uh, and then dips to 12 and then 10 the next day. Uh, so we end up with 12, 20, and 22 freezing degree days for each of those three first days. So those add up cumulatively to 54 accumulated freezing degree days after, after three days. So depending on the site, like I said, the value of alpha changes. So if, if this was something we were calculating on, a, on an average river with snow, 
uh, we just kind of blindly pick from the table to start with, um, although this is much better if you can calibrate. But if you if you assume that you're just pulling from the table the value, we pick an alpha of 0 0.12. Uh, and that results uh, in an estimated thickness of just after, uh, just under an inch um, after three days. Uh, if the site was instead uh, a windy lake with no snow, so more heat transfer, more heat, uh, ice growth, implying that the, the heat could be moved more rapidly from the surface. Uh, the ice thickness uh, is estimated to be uh, 5.9 inches. So clearly the selection of alpha is super important uh, and, and like I mentioned, uh, best calibrated uh, to a site by either looking at historical uh, ice thickness measurements or um, you know, using um, you know, judgment based on experience. So this, this plot here is an example of the accuracy of this relatively simple formulation. On the x-axis, we have the square root of the freezing degree days. And on the y-axis, we have ice thickness. So the slope of this line is alpha. Uh, the value of alpha can be determined for site uh, using this approach, uh, but it also just demonstrates that uh, you know, at this site, this simple model works pretty good. This is uh, at Snowshoe Lake and up, up in Alaska. So I think that's off the Glen Highway. Um, now we're going to shift gears a little bit. We've talked about how to, how to estimate ice thickness. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more high level about models to predict ice jams. Um, there are a number of different reasons to try and predict ice jams to improve emergency response and improve um, the ability to reduce flooding impacts by extending the lead time for emergency response groups to organize and deploy resources. Another important reason is to be able to hindcast events and be able to provide a synthesized record of ice jams uh, that can sometimes form the basis of uh, flood mitigation designs, for example. Uh, the key things that we want to predict are first, if a jam is going to form or not, uh, that's what we're going to refer to as the occurrence of a jam. Next, we're interested in the location of the jam, where are jams likely to occur and cause flooding? Uh, that's, that's the question we're trying to answer there. Uh, getting more specific, we're interested in uh, predicting water levels potentially. So models can address some or all of these, depending on what the objectives are for employing some sort of a predictive model. So occurrence would be something of interest to emergency operations folks, uh, something that could generate an, uh, an indication of elevated risk um, of ice jams, some sort of a notica notification based on that. Occurrence is also of interest as we track the projected impacts of climate change on, on river ice processes. So we can use that potentially as an index uh, moving forward. Uh, location predictions are useful exercises when we're trying to cite early warning equipment like web cameras, uh, also for identifying optimal locations for ice jam mitigation projects, uh, like some of those that went over in the ice control section. Uh, and last, we're interested in predicting water levels resulting from jams for understanding uh, economic impacts, uh, and just overall impacts from flooding, uh, to quantitatively uh, evaluate what an ice jam does. Uh, and, uh, there's a little bit of discussion on that uh, in the FEMA talk, and we'll talk. Jeremy's going to talk a little bit more about uh, ice affected stage frequency as well. Uh, but that, that's an important reason, also. Um, so ideally, we'd be able to develop a totally generalizable method to predict ice jams that we could just broadly apply, uh, and no one would ever be surprised by an ice jam again. Uh, but what we really have are some methods that work okay at a specific location that are that are usually pretty sensitive to the issues that matter at a specific site. Uh, and as a result, the forecast methods that are used uh, vary a lot location to location and for application to application. So a lot of text on the slide, and I apologize for that, um, but we'll, we'll step through here um, piece by piece. Uh, it's basically summarizing the ICM modeling approaches that we currently have. Uh, so first, we've got numerical models. So some of these you might be familiar with, HTC RAS, um, Diner Ice, Rib Jam, uh, there's, there's a, many others as well. Uh, these are useful for, for predicting ice jam geometry on uh, stages based on actually modeling the physics that control these events. Uh, and these can work really well if calibration data is available and if we have the appropriate input data, such as um, ice thicknesses, uh, flow rates, th those sort of things that you, you have to kind of initialize the model uh, with, depending on which model you're using. Some of them can grow ice and that sort of thing too. So. Uh, it really depends on, on what model you're using, um, but it does depend on the, imp uh, the inputs. Uh, so in a forecast mode, uh, these inputs must be forecast. So there's variability in the outputs uh, as well due to the accuracy of the forecast. Uh, and these models are, are very useful because they're physically based and can model events that have never happened before. So we could put in some hypothetical scenarios uh, and, and, and see what the model is suggesting would happen based on 
uh, estimation of the actual physical processes that are going on. Uh, we're going to talk more about HTC RAS uh, tomorrow, uh, so I won't go into any more depth on the numerical models here, uh, and I'll focus, focus uh, a little more on the data-driven models. The data-driven models are, are quite a bit different. They're, there's a few different categories and approaches, and I'm, not, I'm probably not going to touch on all of them. Uh, I probably missed some here, but um, I'll, I'll try to at least give you a, a high-level view here. So there's some more classic empirical statistical models that are built uh, using a record of events and variables uh, that are thought to contribute to, to ICM events, things like temperature, flow rate, kind of the obvious things. Uh, these statistical tools are used to uh, relate these causal variables to the outcome of, of whether you get a GM or not at a specific location. So that, that's, that's one of the more simple models. Um, along the same lines, we have uh, emerging more uh, the use of machine learning tools, uh, which are in some sense an extension of statistical models, uh, but using more complex methods that require more computational resources to build the models um, and uh, predict ISGMs, uh, again, using uh, reasonable input variables like temperature and flow. Uh, so these models can help a forecaster understand which variables are more important than others, uh, which is a nice benefit uh, of some of these methods. Uh, one significant downside is that these models are often kind of abstract is exactly the right word, but they can be difficult or, or impossible to physically interpret. They can kind of be a black box. You put input data in, you get a classification of whether an ICM is going to occur or not, and it's, it's kind of hard to, to tell sometimes like what exactly is the basis for, uh, for that. And so they, they tend to work really well for events that have occurred before, um, but they can have uh, poor predictive power for uh, unusual or complex events that haven't been previously observed. So they're only as smart as the, the data that, that goes into them, um, just based on, on how they're built. Um, so now we'll discuss some examples of, of these data-driven models. This is not, again, an exhaustive discussion, uh, basically just a sampling of methods that have been used to Krell. Um, the first is uh, the threshold identification model. This is a pretty simple and accessible modeling framework. The idea is to identify variables that can be used as an index uh, that once they're exceeded, once they go past some threshold, suggest that an ice jam is probable. Uh, so this is an example of a threshold model that was developed for Oil Creek in Pennsylvania. Uh, the model suggests that a jam is probable if the freezing degree days accumulated over the last 15 days so this is a, a window of 15 days of, of accumulated freezing degree days, not the whole season. Uh, so if that, that running total for 15 days is greater than 120 um, and the flow rate is greater than 1,000 CFS, that suggests that there's going to be an ice jam. Uh, so this was developed by analyzing historical jams in the ice jam database uh, and then using uh, time series of air temperatures and flow rates in the river. Um, it seemed to work pretty well uh, in this particular location. Similarly, uh, Tuthill and others developed a threshold model for the Winooski River in Vermont that's a little bit more complicated using uh, criteria, certain flow rates uh, not being exceeded. Uh, this was used, well, it, it basically, so it's, it's stating that the, there's a window of kind of opportunity that's kind of obvious between December and, and March. Uh, the flow rate needs to be above 1,800 CFS. Uh, there can't be a, any uh, peak flows greater than 1,000 CFS in the previous 30 days. Uh, I think that's probably accounting for uh, potential small breakup events that, that um, might have happened preceding uh, that w didn't allow a particularly intact uh, ice cover to form. Um, the time to peak of, of, the, of an ascending hydrograph is less than three days. And using this method, they were able to identify 13 out of 17 known historical jams. Um, also, there was an the identification of 22 potential jams, um, which it's not clear if those are actually uh, jams or not. So um, it's, it can be a little bit difficult to evaluate the performance of these models, uh, especially when data is, is sparse. Uh, and so there, there has been some research, uh, like I mentioned, using machine learning techniques to predict jams that have been promising. There, there's uh, a number of examples. I'm just going to talk about one. Uh, and this is this is one that uh, Carell was involved with Steve Daly and uh, Kate White, I believe, uh, along with uh, some other folks. Uh, and it, it's an example of an artificial neural network it used to predict jams again at Oil City, a pretty pretty common spot uh, that, that ice jams have been looked at. Uh, and it's using flow rate as an input, transformed with a number of ways. You can see the input variables here on the left. Uh, so we've got uh, flow rate on the Allegheny River um, as an input variable, the log of that flow rate, uh, 
Uh, we've also got the flow rate on Oil Creek and a log transformation of Oil Creek, and then some some input um, variables based on the the change in flow on Oil Creek, uh, as well as the average daily temperature uh, and the um, temperature above freezing degree days, and then and then some uh, collection of accumulated freezing degree day uh, based on different windows of, of time. And so those were all fed into uh, an artificial neural network. Uh, and so discussion of, the, of, of what and how artif artificial neural networks uh, work is a little bit outside the scope of this presentation, but the, suffice to say they're one option in a large suite of uh, machine learning tools that allow a uh, modeler to, to relate uh, kind of a, potentially a long list of input variables to classification outcomes, so taking time series of data and relating it to a binary classification of whether an ice jam uh, occurs or not. Uh, so the uh, the classification um, developed uh, here was with uh, an artificial neural network, but there's others such as random forest support vector machines. Um, these can be effective, and in this case, uh, they demonstrated that the, the neural network did a better job at predicting. Uh, ice jams than uh, purely empirical or purely statistical or combined uh, kind of traditional models. The, ne the neural network performs better. Uh, so that's promising. Uh, but again, it's a little bit of an opaque model. Um, it's a little bit you know, tough to, to tell uh, how well it could do at, at predicting uh, an event that's outside the normal suite of, of events that, that occur. Um, but it could be used to, to go back and, and hindcast uh, events, and that's, that's what they did here. Um, so, kind of ran through a bunch of stuff pretty quickly. I'm just giving you a high-level overview. Uh, there's a lot more uh, to talk about on, on a lot of these individual issues. Um, but uh, so first, we, we covered the Stefan equation and showed a little bit of the derivation of that uh, as a method to estimate ice thickness uh, just from air temperature and some assumptions about the environment. Uh, and then we next dis uh, discussed methods to predict ice jams uh, using using some models. Uh, this is difficult to do because ice jam formation is a very site-specific phenomena. I've talked about that a lot <laughs> in a lot of these talks. That it's, a lot of these processes are very site-specific. Um, it's been shown that some basic empirical and statistical methods have been somewhat successful in predicting ice jams, uh, and that some of the more complex models appear to be promising, uh, but the resulting uh, you know, models are difficult to interpret, of course. Um, and the idea of a generalized and site transferable model as a goal is, is a great goal, but it, it may be hard to achieve just due to the complexity of all these interactions. Uh, with physically based models, we can go and model any location, uh, but, the, but the accuracy of those models require uh, significant knowledge of the sites and detailed information about the parameters that go into that model. So they're good options, uh, but they're, you know, they can be time consuming to set up uh, and require uh, someone with significant knowledge uh, to be able to set them up properly and run them. Uh, so depending on what you're looking for, there might be a model that can help you, uh, but it, it all depends on what, what you need out of the model, of course. So with that, uh, I will open it up to questions.